Welcome back to this third lecture in this lecture series on CCNA4 with me, Joachim Shevrestad from the University of Hvde. And what we will look at in this lecture is remote access, PPP over Ethernet, uh, virtual private networks, uh, GRE, and BGP. So basically, this lecture is about using broadband technologies to access uh, the wide area network, which has, of course, become a, a very popular way because everyone or most of us have an ISP close by that we can just call to get a subscription for a broadband technology where we can just access the uh, the internet and have a way to access uh, or to tie, uh, tie together our different sites using the internet, which is a wide area network infrastructure that is already in place and high capacity. Uh, and uh, to be frank, most businesses or organizations or individuals will need an internet connections, uh, connection anyway, so why not use it as your means of connect connecting different sites and your only wide area network solution. Um, of course, depending on what kind of company you are, you may want to have some private wide area network infrastructure as well, but let's uh, let's skip that discussion for now. Uh, what, what Something that you need to consider is that when you're using the internet or a broadband solution to connect to the internet, what you will actually do is send your private or your uh, company data over the internet, but then what we can do is use a VPN solution to create logical private connections between different sites over the internet. Uh, when we talk about internet connections or broadband connections, there are several broadband options available, including cable, DSL, wireless, and fiber. We will mash through them, uh, ex uh, some of them at least, extremely briefly, and you can read more if you're interested. So something that I noticed about this course is that Cisco seemed to have uh, removed quite a lot of the detailed uh, material, but I think that we can do anyway. Uh, we will also look into two practicals. We will do one for GRE or uh, GRE, which is a, a way of doing virtual private networks without the privacy part because it's unencrypted. And we'll also do a BGP practical. Uh, so first, we'll just go through some of the uh, different options for accessing uh, or connecting to the internet, where the first one is cable technology. So cable technology uh, often uses coax cables uh, that can transmit data using uh, radio frequency signals uh, and operators typically also use something that is called hybrid fiber coax cables or HFC uh, to have backbone networks of high speed. So commonly those networks are converged networks that offer internet access, television and telephone services and has been a very uh, common way of accessing the internet today. Some of the devices that we need in, uh, for cable connections are cable modem termination systems or CMTSs that are at the provider end and then some kind of cable modem, not modal, at the subscriber end. I am sorry for that misspelling. Actually, this slide has two gram uh, spelling errors, but whatever, let's move on to DSL or digital subscriber line. So I'm not sure how it is today out in the world, but in Sweden, uh, DSL or ADSL was a very a popular way of accessing the internet. In essence, DSL is high-speed connections over installed copper wires. That is often the old telephone networks. So ADSL and SDSL are the two different ways that you can implement DSL. Uh, ADSL stands for asymmetric DSL and is a DSL uh, connection where you have a higher downstream than upstream bandwidth. And symmetric DSL has the same capac capacity up and down. Uh, I would say that ADSL was in Sweden a a very, very common way of accessing the internet, but cable connections has taken over, especially as fiber, uh, fiber connections are being more and more popular. So the devices that you need for a DSL line is a transceiver on the customer side, essentially a modem, and a DSLAM at the provider end. And the DSLAM or DSLAM is provider equipment that provi uh, combines uh, different subscriber connections into a high capacity connection to the provider. And I'm sure you all noticed that the more simultaneous users that you have in an ADSL connection, the slower your down, uh, downloading rate is, the more time it takes to download that movie using Casa or LimeWire or whatever you used back in the ADSL days. And that is because uh, the DSLAM becomes a bottleneck. <laughs> Uh, moving on to wireless, I just want to mention that there are many different ways uh, of accessing the internet uh, through wireless. Uh, 
uh, technologies. Uh, municipal Wi-Fi's uh, are one in which you basically have a mesh network of access points that provides wireless con uh, connections in an area. Uh, perhaps more common these days are cellular, cellular or mobile technologies, 3G, 4G. 5G, who, who knows what comes next. Uh, me and a co-worker discussed uh, this free Wi-Fi or municipal Wi-Fi uh, stuff that everyone in Sweden at least are putting up as a big uh, and fantastic pro, but they mostly get in the way of the cellular technology. But of course you will use different options depending on where you are in the world. When you go out on vacation, having a hotel Wi-Fi is uh, something that you value a great deal because your cellular, cellular bill will be extreme if you surf using 5G from your hotel uh, in wherever you are. And for rural areas, we still use satellite communication. I guess we will for some time because satellite uh, provides uh, coverage in areas where it's hard to uh, draw cables or have uh, sufficient 5G coverage. Uh, so let's look into some some technologies and protocols starting with PPP over Ethernet. So as we discussed, uh, PPP is a serial protocol, but ISPs may want to use the benefits of PPP even over Ethernet links. So actually, in today's network, accessing any wide area network using Ethernet is uh, very, very, very common, but PPP still has some uh, benefits or some stuff that is very good for an ISP. So first of all, PPP allows you to configure IP on the remote end of a connection, which is very convenient if you're an ISP because all your customers will not be able to do that configuration on their own. Uh, also using SHAP, you can easily enable or disable a link. Um, for instance, this is good for accounting reasons. You can have uh, you can have a server that keeps track of what customers that paid their bill and if when a customer doesn't pay you will just uh, remove their username from the shop configuration and they won't be able to access the link anymore. Also PPP offers link management and uh, that is also nice from an ISP perspective. So I just have there's no packet tracer um, a packet tracer demonstration for PPPoE simply because Cisco didn't provide a PPPoE a packet tracer activity, but in order to configure PPP over Ethernet, what you would do would be to create a dialer interface. So you would go interface dialer and then a number, and what you essentially do is that you uh, is that you create a virtual interface. So what you do within this interface is that you can input your PPP commands like in, uh, encapsulation PPP, uh, IP address negotiated to have your IP address from the other end. You can have your SHAP configuration and then you create a dialer pool. So what I said here, I said I'm, I, made a, uh, I made a pink mark saying pools must not match. And what I mean with this is that the interface dialer number does not have to be uh, having have the same number as the pool number. I thought that this was a little bit hard to understand from the slides. However, you need to in the interface dialer configure use the command dialer pool and a number and then you need to reuse that number in the interface com command. So when you did this interface dialer configuration, what you must do then is go into an interface like you have been using a one uh, you do no IP interface, you do PPPoE enable, and then you do PPPoE client dial pool number, and then the number from the dialer configuration. So that's it for PPPoE configuration. Now let's go on to VPN. And I guess this is the first part in the Cisco material where we, where we talk about VPN tunnels. But VPN is an extremely, wi extremely widely used um, technology on the internet and within networking and what VPN basically is is a technology that creates a virtual tunnel between one end and another end so you can have a common shared network like the internet but still have a virtual network that directly combines two different sites we're going to exemplify this later using GRI but the idea here is that you can have an encrypted channel between two different sites, between two different computers, and so on and so forth. So we can have a confidential communication even if we're using a shared network, shared network such as the internet. Um, so why should you use VPN or just using dedicated links? Well, first, scalability. 
when you use VPN, the requirements are that every uh, that, that every side that needs to be able to communicate has an internet connection. Instead, uh, instead of when we have dedicated links, we essentially require every site to be connected to each other, meaning that if we have a company with five sites and we're going to add a sixth site, well, then that new site will have to have its own link to every pre-existing site. Uh, also, VPNs are fully compatible with broadband solutions, so, or uh, you may even say that you need broadband to have a good VPN. Uh, security, of course, because it's encrypted, so that's very good. And, of course, cost savings, and the cost savings part basically comes from the scalability and compatibility with broadba broadband attributes. Uh, there are different ways in which we can configure VPN, uh, where site-to-site -site -site and remote access are the most common one. So site-to-site -site VPN is basically a static VPN between sites. So what you do when you set up a site-to-site -site VPN is that you set up a static tunnel uh, or a static, uh, static interface between two sites. Uh, it's basically the equivalent of leasing a line in between those sites. Uh, and typically you would use routers or VPN servers as endpoints at all ends. Uh, then we have the remote access VPNs, and it's basically about connecting a single client to a network. So rather than connecting two networks together, you would uh, give this to your users, and you would let your users connect to your network using their own PC. And this is a very common way uh, of letting remote workers work, but uh, work from home, but it will look logically as if they're a part of your network. Those are also more dynamic in how they're used, because they're used on a as-need basis. Uh, Cisco also has a solution that is called Dynamic Multipoint VPN. I'm going to leave that for you to read up on if you're interested, because now we'll go into Generic Routing Encapsulation, or GRE, which is uh, a site-to-site -site VPN, but it's not so private because it's totally unencrypted, but it does this part of connecting two sites on different parts of the internet together and make them logically direct connected. Uh, so I just want you uh, to show you right down here what it actually does because what happens when you have a uh, when you have a tunnel is that you have your original packet with an IP header, uh, some TCP header, and some data in it. So this is your original header. What happens when you use a tunnel is that you put an outer header on it so that you actually encapsulate the uh, the original header into a, a GRI header and then a new IP header. So the way that you would configure this is by first creating a tunnel interface. You do this with interface tunnel and a number and then you will configure this as a normal interface so you would create it uh, with an IP address. Uh, you have to note that it needs its own IP, uh, IP network because the tunnel itself becomes a, sort of a point-to-point -point connection you would have to specify the tunnel source address and this is the address that it will have to take out of the router uh, and then go over the internet to the other point of the tunnel so this will actually set the exit point for this tunnel you do this using tunnel source and then the ip number and then you would specify the tunnel destination address and that is the remote entry point or the other side of the tunnel you do this with tunnel destination and then the ip address uh, for verification, you can use show IP interface brief and show interface tunnel and the tum tunnel number to verify that it's up and running. Uh, instead of me talking more uh, in theory, what we will do is just head right into Packet Tracer. We will do Packet Tracer uh, task 3.4.2.4 and we will practice building uh, GRI tunnels. So if we just go out here, we'll see that I am in uh, Packet Tracer since before. So what we have here in Packet Tracer is two networks. We have one with PCA and one with PCB. Those networks have a router each, RA and RB, and they are connected through the internet. But what we want is to create a tunnel so that those are logically all uh, connected together. So the way that we would do this is that we will begin setting up the tunnel on router A, and we'll go ahead and do that. So what we need to do is go into our terminal, and we go enable configuration terminal, and then see in the instruction what we should call the tunnel, and we'll just go ahead and type. So we'll make a tunnel interface, interface, tunnel, and we'll call it zero. 
and then we're going to make an IP address for this tunnel. So remember now that the tunnel creates uh, should have its own network, uh, and the IP address that it needs is IP address uh, 10 10 10 zero, and we also need a mask 255 255 255 252, and that is it. Next, we're going to set the tunnel source and the tunnel destination. So we go tunnel source and then the interface that we wanted to exit on. So from our ACE perspective, we should go serial zero 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 uh, and then we should have tunnel destination and now it's the IP address that the tunnel traffic should be sent to which happens to be something that I can't see. So let's look in the instructions. Uh, 209.165.122.2. Uh, so basically that is what is required for the tunnel to work, but we can also specify that it should be carrying IP traffic. And we do this with the command tunnel mode uh, GRE and then IP. So then it's an IP tunnel. IP and that is basically it. So finally to make it active uh, make sure that we just type no shutdown we shouldn't have to but why not nothing uh, nothing weird can happen. So now that we've done that we've done one end of the tunnel and what we said was that if there is any traffic coming here we have a tunnel that should go to router B and to reach router B you should just send it out serial interface uh, zero 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 and it will some way fa uh, and it will find its way over to this site in some way now we're going to use router b to make the second end of the connection so we do the same configuration again uh, we go interface tunnel uh, zero then we give it an ip address ip address 10.10.10.2 so it's on the same network uh, we go tunnel source and we check in the topology where it should exit. So it's again serial zero 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 and then we go tunnel destination and I guess we will have to look in our addressing table at the top here to see uh, RA. It's this address that we need. So tunnel destination 64.103 dot two eleven dot two and that should basically be it we can do tunnel mode re ip as well and we do no shutdown just to be sure now the tunnel is actually fully set up so we can verify the tunnel by doing for instance interface that do show ip interface brief and you can see here that we have a a uh, tunnel that is up and running so it's up up now uh, you you can also go do show ip interface tunnel zero and if we spell it right things will go much better and we will see all sorts of information within it and um, so now there is one final thing that we need to do and that is to uh, create a static route because we already have routing in place traffic from this network will go out on the internet and uh, still be able to reach this network but we want to enforce it to go through the tunnel so we actually have to configure a private private routes for that to happen so for instance we need to go into router a and what we want to achieve here is to um, tell it that traffic sent for the router b network should go through the tunnel <laughs> So the way we do that is by typing the command IP route and then we specify the destination network which is 192.168.2.0 and we need a mask and then it's time to specify the destination. So what we can do is to have the next hop IP which would be 10.10.10.2 which is the other end of the tunnel. So we go into router B and we do the equivalent. So we take exit and we do IP route destination network, which is 192.168.10.255.255.255.0. And the next stop IP 10.10.10 and 
one and enter and that is it. So how can we verify now that the uh, that the tunnel is working correctly? Way well, the easiest way would be to go and do a trace route. So what we will do is go into PCB and what we will do is open a command prompt and we will be doing trace route and we will trace the route to 192.168.1. Let's say one. Okay, trace trace RT. And what we see here is that it jumps directly from this network and into the other network and it skips all the private IP addresses which would have been here if we disabled the tunnel. So the way that we can disable the tunnel is just that we remove the, uh, the routes. So we go no IP route on router B and we go back to, no, uh, to router A and we go uh, no IP routes and now the tunnel won't be used and if I do the trace route again you'll see that it will take more hops because it's going to go out on the internet. It's also going to take some more time. Okay, I'm not really sure how this is configured, so maybe it will just not work because maybe there are no uh, routes out there for this. Let's fast forward the time a little bit. Yeah, you just see that we get a lot of request timeouts, so it's not even working. Uh, and this is how we can see then that the tunnel works as intended and now it doesn't work anymore at all in this particular demonstration. So with that in mind, and uh, this uh, we're going back to the practical and we're going to talk a little bit about BGP and then we'll go back and do a practical on that. So I'm just uh, starting up the slideshow again and heading over to BGP. So what is BGP? Well, it is basically a routing protocol and it's a routing protocol that is commonly used for, uh, for in, uh, on the internet. So it's commonly used by the ISPs. And when we are in the situation of being the system administrator at a local company, uh, what we have to care about BGP is how to take care of, B, uh, how to take care of our little part, so to say. So BGP is basically built around autonomous systems. So every network within a, uh, within the BGP routing domain would have its own AS number. And then uh, BGP doesn't care about the routing within each autonomous system, but you will use BGP in between the different networks or different ASSs, uh, autonomous systems. Uh, there are actually two flavors of BGP. Uh, one is called iBGP, and that is a routing protocol that is called internal BGP that you can use within your autonomous system. And there, then there is external BGP, which will be the focus of this course, which you use in between autonomous systems. Um, so before we move on, uh, we should have some background. So the first question you should know uh, or should ask yourself is whether or not you need to use BGP. And BGP is actually a good option when you have a multi-homed environment. And that is when your autonomous system or when one autom autonomous system is connected to several other autonomous systems. Uh, you should not use BGP in a single home environment when you only have a connection to one autonomous system. Like if you're a company and you only have one way to access the internet, then there is no real point in using BGP. You can just use statical routing instead. Uh, and also you should not use BGP unless you understand it. And that is because uh, misconfigurations within BGP can impact the entire internet because if you advertise routes in, uh, in an erroneous way, you will actually advertise those routes to the entire internet. Uh, yes, there is a routing table that has all internet routes. So if I just go back to this slide, uh, this slide right here, you can see that for AS65002, it's multi-homed because it has one internet connection here and one here. But in an environment where you would not have this one, uh, but only this link right up here, then uh, this autonomous system would be uh, single homed and then you could just configure a static route on this router right here and you would not need BGP. Uh, so with that said, 
let's continue on. Uh, and I, I want to talk to you a little bit about the BGP options. So you can run BGP in, in three different ways, default route only, default route and ISP routes, or all internet routes. This is not something that you must care that much about as, uh, as the administrator of an organization that uh, that is configuring your single endpoint of BGP, but you should know about them. And what it has to do with is how the ISP advertises routes to you. So if you're talking about uh, if we talk about default route only, what's going to happen is that the ISP will advertise a default route to to you only. And this is a very simple setup, but, but it can cause suboptimal routing because you will not know about the best path to every, net, to every network. The second way is default routes and ISP routes. And in this case, the ISP will advertise a default route and route to, routes to autonomous systems that is under the control of the ISP. And the last, uh, the last flavor or option is that you'll just get all uh, internet routes and that requires the local router to handle about 550,000 different internet routes, but it is the option that creates the most optimal routing. So let's go back to our picture again, or let's take this picture. So what I want you to see here is, uh, let's say that we are the network over here and we have two ISP connections. We have, uh, we have this one and we have this one. If we have a setting where we have, uh, where we have a default route only, then both of those ISPs, this ISP and this ISP would just give us a default route. Uh, basically say, if you don't know the destination to anything, send it to me. What we would have then is in best case, some load balancing between the to two different links. Uh, but this would cause a scenario where if we are to send something to the network over here, we would not know the best path, we would just take one of the routes by chance. So the second one is if we have uh, all ISP routes, well, if we get all ISP routes, then we would get one default route from this network here, one default route from this one here, but this ISP would tell us about all routes that it is aware about, and this ISP would tell us about all routes that it is aware about. So it creates optimal routing to all networks within those two ISPs, but suboptimal routing potentially for everything else. And the last option, of course, both ISPs would give us all internet routes and we would be aware of the quickest way to get to anything and life would just be smooth and well. Uh, so where were we? Uh, we are going to look at the configuration of external BGP, which is what we want to do. So it's a routing protocol. So what we need to do first is enable it. And how we do that? Well, we do router BGP. And then we have to take care because we're not uh, just inputting a process number, we are inputting our AS number. And that is something that is assigned to us by the ISP. Uh, then we have to configure BP, uh, BGP neighbors or peering. So we actually have to configure who our neighbor is. And we do this with a command neighbor, the IP of our neighbor, uh, remote AS, and then the neighbor's AS number. And then finally, we ad advertise networks using the command uh, network, network address, and then mask and the subnet mask. Some verification, again, will include show IP route, show IP BGP, and show IP BGP summary so that we know about our neighbors, we can see the BGP process, and we can watch, uh, watch the routes. So before the end of this uh, video lesson, let's do the demo on BGP, which is packet tracer assignment 3.5.3.4, a lot of numbers. Uh, and that is what we're going to do before we end. So we're in here with BGP. So the scenario here is quite simple. We are the Acme network on the far left, and we have subscribed to the ISP network. And what we're going to do is do our BGP configuration. So we are not uh, going to care about what, what mode of BGP we're using. Essentially, we're just getting the routes that uh, the ISP wants to give us. So let's do the configuration now. Let's go have a look. Uh, and the way we do this is that we go in to the console again. Uh, so we do enable, we do configuration terminal, uh, and then we do router uh, BGP and our AS number, which is 65001, and then we hit enter. So the first thing we have to do then is this neighbor and we have to input the IP address of our neighbor, 
which uh, I don't remember right now. So let's scroll down into the task here and we'll see that it is uh, all once. And then remote AS, which in this case is 65,003. And then that's it. And you can see instantly that we have a, a neighbor neighbor up. So we have a router adjacency. Things seem to work well. Last thing we have to do is to uh, market our network. So we do network and then the uh, IP address is 192.168.0.0 uh, and the mask is 255.255.255 and zero. So that's it. Let's fast forward the time a little bit. And I'm just going to go ahead and have a look at the routing table to, to show IP route. And you can see here that we have two BGP routes that's coming and that's been coming to us. So that's all nice and well. Uh, now we actually have to do the other side as well because of some technical reason with this assignment. So let's scroll all the way down and see if we can have all the information that we need. Uh, so in this case, we go into other co and what we need to do is go enable configuration terminal uh, router BGP and our, our AS number, which is 65,002. And then we have to do this neighboring again. So we pair up with the ISP router. So neighbor and we'll see what was it. 1.1.1.9 remote AS 65,003 and then you can see that it worked because we get paired up with with a neighbor. The last thing we just have to do is do network 172.16.10.0 and 255.255.255 and 0 and of course I forgot to input mask fast forward time a little bit and then if we go back to the Acme router you can see that we now have a route to the route uh, to the network of other co. So that was it for this demonstration if you have any questions you can post them in the comments field uh, I hope that you learned something um, and I hope that I will see you next time where we go back for ACLs uh, which will basically be the same as what we did in CCNA2 but with a little bit more focus on IPv6. So thank you, thank you for watching and see you in the next lesson.